Well, good afternoon. Thank you for that very generous introduction, and many thanks for the opportunity to be here and talk with you about your uh, voyage into managing diabetes. Um, what I'd like to do is share with you a little bit of the, you know, Jean mentioned the Florida experience. My other hat is a medical director of the Florida Healthcare Coalition. And I'd like to share with you a little bit of that experience and uh, some of the findings that we've had. And the spirit of this is really what's useful. What might you be able to incorporate in what you're going to embark on in terms of managing diabetes? So the real challenge, is it up? Ah. A word about the Florida Healthcare Coalition. Just two seconds. It's been around for 27 years. The focus is on improving quality uh, in the communities where the coalition has members, and that's primarily in Central and South Florida. Uh, the membership is a very interesting and diverse mix. You can see the companies that are involved here. It's an interesting mix of public and private. We have local governments, uh, private corporations. If you look at the companies, defense industry, service industry, retail industry, and entertainment, you'll see uh, Universal and Disney down here on the bottom. So it's quite a swath of companies. And why should these companies be interested in diabetes? Well, Ken painted a very interesting picture for you earlier in terms of the extent of the diabetes epidemic and some of the costs, but let me bring it down to what our employers know. And that is, every diabetic that they have as an employee will cost them between two and three times as much per year in healthcare costs as the individual without diabetes. More importantly, if you look at absenteeism and disability rates, Diabetes and its uh, complications are about the leading cause, comes in right after depression in terms of driving absenteeism. So our employers get it. They wanted to do something about diabetes and it's been a long, long standing process. I've tried to show some of the major uh, programs up here and uh, MTM means medication therapy management involving the pharmacist and uh, helping to manage the diabetic. KYN, know your numbers. And by the way, that was just the beginning. There's been know your numbers campaigns all the way through this. The uh, pharmacy access project, which was really the uh, value-based design project, which is written up in that paper that uh, Jean mentioned. And last but not least, and we think the most important to the multi-stakeholder projects. So I'm not gonna go through all of these and try to give you details about it. What I really wanna do is talk about what we've learned about the prevalence of the condition, how is the treat condition being treated in the community, and this really speaks to individual engagement and physician engagement, and then what did we learn about some interventions and some outcomes that are associated with those interventions. So the first thing, you know, Ken put up a slide earlier that uh, I think the number was 27% of diabetics are not diagnosed. We came kind of close to that. What we're finding routinely is it's at least 30% of diabetics are not diagnosed when we do screenings. Let me give you, this is data at, from an actual screening that we did. And if you look here, it's arrayed by hemoglobin A1C levels. So you can see the 32% of the people who came through the screening had elevated hemoglobin A1C levels, and yet they were, had no medical claims, no treatment for diabetes. What's really worrisome when you look at this number is you can say, well, about half of them were below eight. And we can have a brisk discussion, what's the right number, 6.5 or seven? But let's say it's at least seven. So a half of the year, but look at some of these numbers that are higher up. Very high prevalence of people walking around with diabetes. By the way, this was a population that had incredibly good healthcare insurance. This was a public sector employee, employer. So th this is just people who had the means to get uh, diagnosed and treated, and it just didn't happen. Okay, so we learn not to trust medical claims. 
<laughs> we've learned to go out there and do biometric screening to bring people into a program, something you may want to think about. The next part of this is the blame game. You know, it's kind of easy to say, uh, it's the doctor's fault. Uh, the physicians aren't uh, doing the right thing in terms of treating the condition. They're not writing the right prescriptions. They're too influenced by other outside factors. Well, we had an opportunity to test that little theory. And specifically, for the clinicians in the room, this might look familiar to you. It's the American Diabetes Association, Nathan Guidelines for Treating a Diabetic. I won't drag you all the way through this, but the reality is that there are guidelines. We do have a matrix that we can measure performance against. And we actually had an opportunity to do this. We've done it multiple times now with different populations. The results are almost always the same. You find about three quarters of the uh, patients have prescriptions for medications which are totally consistent with the guidelines. They're well within the guidelines. Now this is the prescriptions that they've got, or at least what the doc is writing. Uh, maybe 25% are outside the guidelines. Within that, you're always going to find some people who need something that's different than that's outside a guideline. And we did find some physicians who could use a little help, if you will, <laughs> in terms of what they were doing. But that's a small minority. So if it's not the doc's fault, and I hate to use the word fault, but you know, if it's not the doc, who is it? Well, let's look at how people take their medications. <laughs> and we're looking at uh, medication possession rate. And what this means is just the percentage of days in a year that a person actually has the medication that they should have to treat the condition. This is pulled from uh, some uh, external control data that we used for one of our studies, but it's pretty representative because it comes from the Thomson Reuters database. Uh, over 5 million participants in it, and we looked at it over a number of years. Now, just to give you a frame of reference, good therapy treatment should be an NPR of 80%, and 60 to 80 is marginal. We can't even make marginal out here on the out outside controls. So that's beginning to tell us that there is an issue. Doc writes the script, people take it home, nothing happens, or they don't take it for, an, for other reasons. So let's get into those other reasons. It can be education, it can be motivation, it can also be cost. So this is a very interesting study. It's a meta-analysis, and it was looking at what is, what is the out-of-pocket exposure, what's the relationship of that to somebody not getting a prescription filled? And uh, it's specific for diabetes. So let's look at this. You start at a probability of one. First four times, okay. For zero copay, in other words, free drugs, you still get a decay rate right in through here. If you will, human behavior. You can't just give people the medication. You have to educate them and engage them. That said, what if we put a copay in front of it? And here, I'll go to the bottom one, $31. You can see the line. We've almost guaranteed that the person is not going to get that script filled over a period of time. Now, you say, OK, so what is $31? Well, for those of you who are familiar with the system, $31 copay is usually for a branded drug on a preferred level. And that's insulin. <laughs> That's one of some of the more advanced drugs to treat diabetes. So basically, it's the exposure to the copay, which is one of the problems we have here. That doesn't negate the issues of uh, education uh, and compliance, but certainly we've got to look at the financial exposure. And that's what I'll pursue a little bit later.